Hello again. In the last lecture, we looked at the beginnings of anti-colonial protest, usually called nationalism, in 20th century Africa. We did offer the caveat, however, stating or making a comparative point about the difference between classical nationalism as seen in modern European history and classical nationalism as seen in recent African history. In Europe, it was usually nations defined ethnically, linguistically, culturally, which sought a state of their own. In Africa, the nationalists largely sought to mobilize people of various nations, various ethnic identities against the common uh, enemy of the colonial state. Nonetheless, we stress that for a real takeoff to occur for these movements, there needed to be the joining of the elite voices, the head, in my crude analogy offered last time, with mass political participation from ordinary people, the body, if you will. We saw that the elements of this began to emerge pretty clearly in the decade uh, of the 1940s, in the dozen years or so around the Second World War. Still, the momentum which nationalism and decolonization developed surprised almost everyone. From a long-run perspective, the decolonization of most of Africa, like its colonization, occurred remarkably quickly. In 1950, almost no one on any side of the question would have predicted that a decade hence, that 1960, would be the, the Annus Mirabilis, the, the year within which, on a few, within, a, within a few years on, on one side or the other, most of Africa's countries would in fact become independent and celebrate that independence. But that is precisely what happened. Now, we can discern two broad patterns in the transition from colony to independence. One refers to the nations I mentioned a moment ago, those which become independent from colonial rule around 1960 uh, and do so in comparatively, I, I stress that, in relatively peaceful fashion. And second, the countries, almost invariably settler colonies, which saw bloody and protracted liberation struggles and which saw the emergence of independence with majority rule considerably later, between 1975 and 1994. In this lecture, we consider the first cluster, that is, those who become independent around 1960, largely from the French and British Empire. We accept the Belgian colony of the Congo because we will give it its own complete attention uh, in the, the next lecture. The second group, the settler colonies which saw wars of liberation and emerged from them as independent with majority rule much later, we will consider in Lecture 27. The 1940s and 1950s were incredibly exciting times in Africa, full of expectation, even if the direction of change of possibility was not always clear. Again, it wasn't necessarily perfectly clear that the nationalist movements beginning to take off at that time would, would culminate in the, the nation states we have today. The senior uh, historian from Ghana, one of the eminent figures in African studies uh, anywhere, starts an article on that period simply with his own reminiscence. It's a simple sentence, but it's powerful. It was certainly good to be alive in those days. This notion of enormous possibility, this feeling that Whatever direction it takes, now is our time. It's time for Africans to come out of the wings, to step onto center stage, that we need to assert that we are indeed part and parcel of the modern world. You saw this bubbling forth and coming out in so many ways uh, in this period. I'd like to give you two examples of the flavor of possibility that I'm talking about here. And they both came in the aftermath of this remarkable string of urban protests, of protests along the railway lines, that is the crucial infrastructure uh, created during the colonial project. 
The first is from Jasper Savanu, the head of the so-called Bantu Congress in southern Rhodesia, and it's in the aftermath of the major uh, strike on the Rhodesia railways in both northern and southern Rhodesia in 1945. He said, the railway strike has proved that Africans have been born. The old African of tribalism and selfishness has, has died away. Africans realize as never before that united they stand and divided they fall. The days when a white man could exploit us at will are gone and gone forever. 1945. Now, a second statement comes from a rather different sort of voice. It comes from Usman Simbin, uh, who is certainly Africa's most distinguished filmmaker, and that is his principal role, but he's also a novelist, an essayist, and one of the incredibly multi-talented figures to emerge in the last 50 years or so out of the continent. He wrote a novel called God's Bits of Wood, which was set precisely during the strike on the French West African railway line in 1947 and 1948. And in fact, he published this book in 1960, the, the, the great year of, of celebration, uh, which I mentioned a moment ago. At one point, Simbian writes in this novel that the strike, quote, was a time for suffering for many, but it was also a time for thought. When the smoke cleared from the trains, no, when the smoke from the trains no longer drifted above the savannah, they realized that an age had ended, an age their elders had told them about, when all of Africa was just a garden for food. Now the machine ruled over their lands, and when they forced every machine within a thousand miles to halt, they became conscious of their strength, but conscious also of their dependence. They began to understand that the machine was making them a whole new breed of men. It did not belong to them. It was they who belonged to it. Now, it's ironic that he uses the term dependence in the year of independence, but the notion that we are part of modernity, that we can no longer be separated, using the imagery of the railway here, the very symbol of the industrial, the modern age, uh, uh, come to, to Africa. Okay, sense of possibility. From one perspective, there is great irony, or it seems that way, that of all the European empires in Africa, it was the French and British empires, precisely those which were the most flexible and the most reformist, consciously adopting a, a developmentalist strategy after World War II, it was those empires which collapsed first. On second thought, maybe that's not ironic. Maybe when authoritarian systems create openings, space, when they attempt to reform, those spaces are seized upon and widened in ways that create cracks that lead the whole edifice to fall before we ever expect it to happen. I wonder if that's applicable to the fall of the Soviet Union, for instance, which saw a reformist period late in its day and one which obviously did not uh, last. There must have been a great number of officials in London and Paris as they tried to adopt this developmentalist reformist stance who must have been muttering under their breath or writing their minutes on the colonial documents versions of the old notion of give them an inch and they repeatedly take a mile. Let's turn to the French case first. In the French colonies, skilled so-called evolués, evolué means literally the evolved ones, an interesting term in itself, uh, those who had taken advantage of the French policy of assimilation. People like Leopold Senghor, the great poet and, and writer uh, who was part of the negritude movement emerging in, in Paris and in the colonies in the 1930s. Leopold Senghor of Senegal, Félix Houphouet Boigny in the Côte d'Ivoire in the, in the Ivory Coast, uh, who took advantage, as they say, of that policy of assimilation, but had also proven themselves to be uh, extremely skillful uh, politicians in a more retail sense, in a more nuts and bolts uh, sense. And they built formidable political machines uh, in their respective home territories in the 1940s and 50s. They gained support precisely because they pr uh, pressed the late colonial French developmentalist state to meet the demands uh, 
and the needs of their fellow Africans, farmers and workers. If you're going to be developmentalist, if you're going to speak as even the French in Paris began to speak of a common citizenship in a greater France that would include the, the colonial territories, then you need to treat workers as full workers, as they would be treated in France. You need to give them the rights associated with this talk of citizenship. They did not, people like Senghor, Houphoué, until surprisingly late in the day, call for independence. In other words, they adopted a sort of press and wait and see attitude when the French made these offers of reform and developmentalism. For their part, the French officials found the escalating demands increasingly difficult to manage and began to question, privately at first, later out loud, whether, on balance, it was worth all the trouble. Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French, of course, during the Second World War and who be, becomes the French premier in the, in the 1950s, and who genuinely felt gratitude for the colony's efforts in the Second World War in particular, thought at a certain juncture in the mid to late 50s that he could perhaps settle on and get agreement to uh, a halfway house. He made an offer of what amounts to essentially self-government, but self-government within the empire to the, the colonies of French West and Equatorial Africa. The question was put to popular referendum, in fact, in the African colonies in 1958. Now, only one of the French colonial territories rejected de Gaulle's offer, but it was an important exception. Guinea's Sécu Touré by choosing total autonomy, by mobilizing and convincing the electorate in his territory to reject this halfway house, to reject the offer of self-government within the empire, seemed to have a, a sort of rippling, uh, radicalizing effect right through the rest of the French territories. And at this point, the die was cast for the French Empire. France itself quickly moved to cut the colonial cord, concluding indeed that it was not viable to retain it or worth the cost of retaining it any longer. At this point, the African leaders could hardly afford not to keep pace. All the French territories became independent in 1960, all of those except for uh, uh, Guinea, which had chosen the full independence in 1958. They became independent, though it's worth noting at this point that they became independent separately as Senegal, as Mali, Niger, Guinea, uh, etc. Not as part of a block, such as in some respects had been created in French West Africa uh, and so on. Fred Cooper calls this the French policy of divide and cease to rule. Now, decolonization in the, the British Empire shows considerable parallels with the process I've just outlined in the, in the French. The process was somewhat more confrontational, I would say. And that is probably due, in part, no doubt, to, to a, a traditionally cooler British attitude toward the the educated natives, so-called, who led the nationalist movements. Again, they were often seen as ringleaders, troublemakers, uh, etc. Still, the weapon of the nationalists in the somewhat more confrontational decolonization process in the British Empire, still the weapon of the nationalists was, you know, the, the mimeographed and, uh, and, and distributed broadside, handed out by the, the so-called veranda boys, as the British uh, called them, the the activist youth in a, in a city like Accra. Um, their weapons were the rally, the march, the boycott, and again, the strike if necessary. It was rarely orchestrated violence. In the West African territories of the Gold Coast and Nigeria, 
Figures like Kwame Nkrumah, often called the father of African nationalism, and Namdi Azikiwe in Nigeria, both of whom who had, had studied, uh, by the way, in the United States and learned from African-American struggles, played roles roughly similar to that played in the French case by Sangor and Houfwe. That is, press the colonialists again and again, harder and harder, to honor the developmentalist prices, uh, promise. Nkrumah is especially significant, truly one of the giants of 20th century African uh, history, and as I said, often labeled the father of African nationalism. Nkrumah called his version of nonviolent uh, strategy, he called it positive action, and it's comparable in a number of respects to, for instance, the militant nonviolence championed by Martin Luther King in the American case. A truly charismatic figure, Nkrumah adopted an increasingly bold vision, not just of independence for the Gold Coast, which he made clear early on he would rename Ghana, but of none, nothing less than a United States of Africa. It's his term. His Pan-African vision inspired many other leaders, and he himself moved steadily towards a more radical stance embracing various versions of socialism. By about 1955, one can sense that British officials like the French are beginning to calculate the costs and benefits of continuing colonial rule versus an option or options including the devolution of power, political power, and the hope of enjoying good, re good relations especially good economic relations with the future rulers. You get the idea that in London and Paris there's a great deal of weighing going on. They're saying, what can we keep? Well, at what cost? What must we give up in order to retain, etc., and so on. Now, Nkrumah proved impossible to contain, or again, perhaps not worth trying to contain in the Gold Coast. The Gold Coast became Ghana in 1957, the first sub-Saharan country to gain independence. Nearby, Nigeria inevitably followed in 1960. It's again worth noting that as the genuine possibility of political power approaches, but on a territorial basis, the heyday of the Pan-Africanist visions, despite Nkrumah's uh, enunciation of a hope for a United States of Africa, the actual possibility of such a thing uh, begins to, to wane as territory after territory becomes actually ruled and power is exerted by actual rulers uh, over actual independent territories. Now again, the die seemed cast and the tide of independence moved steadily in the British Empire towards the east from these bases in the Gold Coast to Nigeria and eventually southward. In East Africa, Tanganyika became independent under another visionary, one often compared with, for, for solid reasons, with Nkrumah, and that was Julius Nyerere. The teacher, he had been a teacher, he was a, a secondary teacher, um, went on to earn a PhD in, in Scotland, like so many of these uh, figures from this generation had gone overseas for advanced study and in fact was fondly, almost reverently, referred to by his followers as Mwalimu, Swahili for the teacher. Tanganyika then granted independence in 1961, a year after Nigeria. Uganda follows a year after that in, in 1962. Now let us turn south and we encounter some some interesting obstacles. Further south, the British dissolved the Central African Federation in 1963. This federation was technically called the Federation of the Rhodesias and Nyasaland. It involved, therefore, Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, and, um, and Nyasaland. Two of those three, 
became independent with majority rule, Nyasaland as Malawi and Northern Rhodesia as Zambia uh, in October of 1964. The subsequent history of the third territory, though, Southern Rhodesia, shows graphically the difference that a substantial white settler population would make. We'll come back to the Southern Rhodesian, now Zimbabwean case at, at other junctures in the rest of this uh, course. For now, let us observe that the tide of freedom, if you like, the tide of independence, had hit a wall. It had come to a barrier, and that barrier might be symbolized by the Zambezi River, dividing southern Rhodesia from, from northern Rhodesia, now Zambia. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned Kenya in East Africa, and that is because the case of Kenya deserves special attention. We've seen a correlation between the degree of white settlement and the path to independence. All of the relatively peaceful transitions surveyed here were basically in non-settler colonies. Now, Kenya was somewhere in the middle of the spectrum on this, a bit on the, on the fence. Certainly, there were many thousands of settlers who held, uh, in many cases, vast estates in what was called the, the, the White Highlands of central Kenya. But the total white population never approached what you would found in southern Rhodesia, in Angola, in Mozambique, let alone in what I call the granddaddy of settler territories in Africa, of settler colonies, and that, of course, is South Africa. Now, a renowned, dramatic example of armed, anti-colonial violence did break out in central Kenya. And it therefore represents an exception to my comparatively or relatively peaceful uh, transitions to independence in the years around 1960. The world knew this revolt as Mau Mau, and it was widely interpreted in the 1950s as an almost otherworldly eruption of inherent, quote, native savagery. It was seen as the antithesis of modernization and, and practice, again, a sort of bubbling forth uh, of a primitive reaction to the progress, the development, which the British saw themselves as, as bringing to Africa. The Mau Mau insurgents were largely of the Kikuyu ethnic group. They attacked white settlers on the farms and Africans, many of them Kikuyu, who were deemed to be collaborators, stooges, sellouts, such as the appointed chiefs. Again, this was a case where the institution of chiefship was, had very little roots in indigenous Kikuyu culture, but was in a sense elevated and created precisely as, as functionaries in the colonial rule. And not surprisingly, some of these figures became targets of the Mau Mau insurgents. In some respects, then, Mau Mau was not only an anti-colonial revolt, and specifically an anti-settler revolt, it was that, but in some respects, it was also uh, a Kikuyu civil war. Now, this was an armed re revolt. It was, a, it was an episode which certainly involved violence. But the rebel attacks resulted, in actual numerical terms, in relatively few casualties, most certainly uh, among the, the white settlers. The number of settlers who died during Mau Mau was 32 total. The number of British, including the security forces that were dispatched uh, in substantial numbers to, to deal with the, um, the revolt, was 95. About 2,000 of the so-called loyalist Kikuyu, uh, 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 whom the Mau Mau opposed, died. On the other hand, something like 11,500, the official figures there, uh, of the rebels were killed. 1,200 of them, at least, were hung. This was an astonishingly heavy 
response on the part of, of the British to this rebellion. And I think it has to be seen in uh, the context of a kind of frustration that British officialdom is fe feeling at that time. Their reasoning was sort of, we've, we've made the turn, we, we, we shifted to the reformist de developmentalist approach, and here are these folks who are taking oaths and swearing that they will uh, drink the blood of a European and so forth in the, in the sensationalistic accounts that came out. So the frustration with this, that they won't accept our, our good intentions here, I think fuels some of the ferocity of this response. There are two new books which document this in, in grisly detail, David Anderson's Histories of the Hanged and uh, Caroline Elkin's Imperial Reckoning uh, provide detail after detail of this. Something like 30,000 Kikuyu were put into what amounted to temporary concentration camps and put through a bizarre um, thing called the pipeline, which was designed to sort of psychologically cleanse them of their collective temporary insanity, as it were, and return them to the fold as, uh, as, as reliable uh, workers and, and colonial subjects. Nonetheless, within a few years of Mau Mau, the British concluded that Kenya was not worth uh, fighting. Maybe I shouldn't say nonetheless. Maybe it's precisely because of Mau Mau that they reached that conclusion. It was not worth fighting to keep. And here, the settler component again, the settlers were not strong enough to defy the British government on their own. Bear that in mind, because when we come back to comparing the situation where, with a, a colony, a British colony, which had substantially more settlers, about five times as many, and that is southern Rhodesia, keep that option of settlers on their own defying uh, British plans uh, in mind. So power passed in 1963 to Kenya's first uh, African ruler, its first president, Jomo Kenyatta. The man whom the British had imprisoned for several years in the 1950s because of his suspect, uh, suspected associations with Mau Mau. As they had with Nkrumah, the British concluded that the wiser course was to try to deal with persons, after all, Western educated persons, intelligent persons, and persons with credibility in the subject populations, formerly subject populations, they concluded that the wiser course was to try to deal with these persons they had once condemned as, quote, forces of darkness, unquote. It's worth reiterating as we move to conclusion that France and Britain ultimately chose to negotiate independence with elites they hoped would be reasonably cooperative, especially economically, after independence. It's also true that they sensed that the enormous hopes being engendered in the nationalist era would soon turn to disappointment. That it might be preferable, they reasoned, that people be disappointed with leaders drawn from their own ranks. Thus, it's possible that the transition from colonialism to independence represents not just a transfer of power, but a transfer of impending or approaching crisis. Many have called it the crisis of rising expectations. For instance, listen to the governor of Nigeria in 1955 writing to the colonial office, quote, inevitably the people are going to be disillusioned and it's better they should be disillusioned as a result of the failure of their own people than that they should be disillusioned as a result of our actions. Okay. Independence for so much of Africa had come then. The nationalists had wrested control of a state apparatus designed above all to maintain order and to preside over an in import-export nexus secondarily and late in the day to pursue the developmentalist aims of delivering certain services. They had won the prize. What would they do with it? This leads us to the era of independent Africa, which will concern us, of course, in much of the rest of this course. We will, in the following, uh, immediately following lectures, however, take a, a slight diversion
We need to, in a sense, catch up with what's been going on in other parts of Africa, particularly in Southern Africa, and in the cases of the late decolonizations, those who did not share in this process culminating around 1960. And in the next lecture, I'm going to turn full scale and devote our entire attention to a particular case with enormous consequences, it seems to me, uh, of the, the group I've been talking about. I want to focus in our next lecture on the Congo. Thank you.